Hello and welcome to the Freelance Festival, where each week we meet new business owners who share their expertise on how to run a successful business. This week we're talking mental health, how you can look after yours while growing a business and how to spot the signs of burnout. For this, we've partnered with Jackie Kemp, a hypnotherapist and director of Your People Potential to get her best advice on managing our mental health. Hi, I'm Jackie Kemp from Your People Potential and I work with organisations to help support good mental health and wellbeing in the workplace and also to help develop management skills and behaviours so that managers can support good mental health in the workplace. So in this session today, we are going to look at the link between stress and mental health and understand where the difference is. We'll look at the signs of poor mental health and the signs of stress and struggling to cope and help you to learn to identify the signs within yourself. I'll also talk a little bit about the impact that coronavirus has had on people's well-being before we talk about what you can do as a business owner to take care of your mental health and your well-being. So let's look at the link between stress and mental health. And this is called the yerkes dodson curve. And it shows that there are actually three areas, mainly three quite distinct areas where we need to be looking after our mental health. And that middle area of well-being, where we can see that we're in a good place here, this is your optimal level of stress. And either side of that, we have the area where it's called hypostress, where there's not enough stress and that leads to boredom. That boredom can in itself then lead to depression and lethargy and just an unwillingness to, or an inability even, to do normal everyday things. Then we have an area where we're in a good level of pressure and that's called eustress, where there's enough pressure for us to get out of bed, there's enough purpose in our day that helps us to get on with the day, to focus on what we need to do and to be able to perform at our optimal level. And then the final phase is if that level of pressure continues for too long, or if the pressure peaks and gets too much, then we can dip into hyperstress, which is where we get to a point of burnout, disengagement, exhaustion. And again, that can lead to depression and anxiety. Stress in and of itself is not a mental health condition, but prolonged stress can lead to poor mental health. And the main, the most common mental health conditions that we are faced at the moment are basically depression and anxiety. And those are the things that you will either recognise in yourself or in friends or family or people that you know. These are the issues that people are experiencing. Then change. Change has a negative impact on our ability to cope. And this change curve comes from the work of a woman called Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And she did research into the way that people experience bereavement. And the work that she did initially started with people who were given a terminal diagnosis. And they found, she found that people experience that same level of emotional response to a diagnosis. The work was then taken to look at people who experience a bereavement and then occupational psychologists took it into the workplace. But what we've actually found is that we all respond to change through this same curve. And the first part is that denial piece. So we're told that something's not gonna happen or something's changing. Think back to lockdown. And you go into denial, you kind of become, you perform better, you do more, you kind of pretending that's not really going to happen, this isn't really happening to me. And then we go down that curve and our performance drops off a bit and we get a bit low. And we actually go through a phase of anger and we think, why is this happening to me? We start to question what's going on around us before we get to that deepest level where we hit the sadness phase and it's, oh, poor me kind of phase. 
before moving up to we negotiate and bargain how do i make this work for me what do i need to do that makes me that helps me to adapt to this new situation and then we get to a level of acceptance and then before you know it somebody else comes along and here you go there's another lockdown now we're going back through the curve so if you think of it in terms of coronavirus and the impact that that may have had on you in 2020 then you may see that you yourself have gone through this experience i liken it to in a very simple everyday way if you get in your car and your car doesn't start the first thing you do is you keep turning the key or pushing the start button in those new cars to try and make that car start so you're in denial you say no this isn't happening let's make the car start then you get to a point of anger so you might hit the steering wheel you might swear you might <laughs> but basically you get through it very quickly before you slump and you get into oh now what there's your sadness side of things what am i going to do now before you get out of the car and you get to that point of negotiation right i need to do this i need to get kids to school i need to get a lift i need to get the car fixed whatever it is you're negotiating through and then you get to that level of acceptance now that's a very easy everyday way that this can be experienced but what we do is we actually get out of the car sometimes people can get stuck in one of those earlier stages in the anger or the sadness of the change that's going on for them. So if you find that that's you, I liken it to you haven't really gotten out of the car. So we need to be doing things that help us move on, that help us get to that negotiation and bargaining stage. And in the current climate with the changes that have happened, it's quite normal for people to have these experiences. And as we move through, into the world where there's a vaccine but we know that that's a slow fix we will still experience this so recognize that when we resist change what we actually do is we hold ourselves back in that level of anger and sadness and we're not helping ourselves to move through to that negotiation and bargaining phase so I would say if you are facing change, if you're facing changes that you haven't planned, the impact that coronavirus has had on many people's businesses, if we're holding on to what we believe should still be happening, then that will have a negative impact on our ability to move through this and also our ability to deal with it effectively. And we are more likely to be impacted stress mental health if we are resisting these changes so if we think about coronavirus the way that it's pushing people's buttons at the moment and the way that it has pushed people's buttons throughout 2020 we can start to see that actually our responses might not be responses that we would ordinarily choose but our buttons are being pushed and that means that what's really happening is our fight or flight um, is being triggered. So our stress response is being triggered by the changes that we've been experiencing and by what's been going on around us in the world at the moment. Um, when we have that stress response, what happens is adrenaline, noradrenaline and cortisol released into the body. It's a hormone dump into the body. Our oxygenated blood goes to our arms and our legs. And it basically prepares us to deal with a threat. And we, when we first evolved, the threats that we faced were that we would come out of our cave and we would see a saber-toothed tiger and there is something that's gonna kill me right here, right now. So what do we do? We freeze. Our first response is freeze. And the idea of the freeze is that it gives us a few seconds to think, where's the best direction to run? And it is all about running. And I know that this um, response has been called fight or flight, but actually the way that it works is we freeze, then we get the flight, then we run. We've worked out which direction to go in and we go there. And only if that doesn't work do we come on to the actual fight side of things. Now, back in the day, 
when we lived in caves and there was a saber toothed tiger, this is a very slow, a very quick rather response. So we have that adrenaline dump, that hormone dump in our body. We do whatever we need to do to stay alive or basically we get caught and it's game over anyway. But we do what we need to do to stay alive and then the hormones dissipate. The activity of running or fighting has actually helped to remove that hormone dump in the body, but then it's gone. Thinking about the modern day, this is designed to be short lived. It's not designed to be something that stays with us. In the modern day, for people experiencing anxiety, depression, for anyone whose stress levels are really high, and we're trying to maintain that really high level of performance, that then leads to poor mental health outcomes because we are not designed to hold that hormone, that chemical dump in our bodies for too long. Lockdown pushes us into freeze. It makes us just freeze and hold. So we can't do those things that are designed to actually get rid of that stress dump. And then what happens when we become stressed is that our behaviour will change. And it will change in one of a few different ways. So we might withdraw. And I know for me, especially when I was in HR, this was my favoured response to stress. If I was stressed, I would withdraw to my office, shut the door, get my head down. I wouldn't take breaks. So I wouldn't have a lunch break. I wouldn't go for a walk at lunchtime with friends. I wouldn't even go and get myself a cup of tea or coffee because I knew I walked to the kitchen, put the kettle on, someone would talk to me, ah, I haven't got time for this. So I was just head down, total withdrawal. The way that we might see this in the current environment is that we might kind of start missing meetings. We might not go to meetings or we might have our phone on while we're in a meeting and we might not be totally engaged in that meeting. And we kind of become a bit evasive. And you'll recognise for you if this is your, your immediate go-to when you're stressed, is to withdraw. Another sign is aggression. So we might become more aggressive, more angry. I know for me in HR, once I'd shut the door, if somebody then opened the door and came and asked me something, I may have been slightly more snappy than I would normally. And that's kind of my stress response, my second go-to is that snappy aggression. Now, I've never hit anyone, <laughs> but, you know, you might, your mouse, you might take it out a bit on your mouse. Things like that. You might become snappy. Other forms of aggression are becoming a bit gossipy about other people and sort of shouting maybe and just being a bit more overly aggressive in the bigger workplace. There might be bullying behaviours and things like that going on as well. Another form is regression. So we get a bit sulky, a bit childlike, a bit why me kind of thing. We might be oversensitive to things and we might maybe feel more emotional, more like crying. And I know in the years since I went self-employed in 2009, I've had moments where my stress levels were high worrying about bringing in enough money, having enough clients, keeping the business going. There have been times when I've kind of at the end of the day just asked my husband for a hug, cried on his shoulder and said, oh, it's not going great. I just needed to lean on him, but to allow myself to express in that way. And it's good to allow yourself to express in that way, but recognise if you get stuck, in that childlike behaviour and in that constant emoting, that can be problematic. And then we have other more physical signs. There are other signs. So we might not sleep as well. We might be tired all the time because we're not sleeping well enough. And actually, there is a link between stress and poor sleep and the fact that if we are stressed, what we tend to do is we tend to have far more dreams in our sleep, which is our brain making sense of the world, and we have far less of the deep regenerative sleep that we need to have to wake up feeling refreshed. We might have other physical signs, so we might actually 
I know for me, if I'm very stressed, I can lose half a stone in weight in a week without changing anything in my dietary habits. It just drops off. Other people may eat more, may comfort eat more, and there's everybody talking about the coronavirus stone. I know I've put on a bit of weight <laughs> myself, but you know, we might drink more alcohol, we might rely more on recreational drugs, we may partake, partake in more risky behaviours. Recognise for yourself what your way of doing stress is. It will eventually have an impact on our ability to work effectively. So we might start to miss deadlines, might make to make, start to make mistakes, we might not return calls when we should, we might not reply to emails as quickly as we might have, we might miss more opportunities because the world just feels so big and it all feels so difficult for us. So recognise, I would encourage you to recognise if any of this is true for you, how you do stress. And I call it doing stress rather than being stressed because if we say being stressed, then we take it on as a level of our identity. It belongs to us. Whereas if we're just doing stress, it's something that we can choose to step out of. And it's very subtle, very different language, but it gives an instruction to the unconscious brain. If I say I am stressed, the unconscious brain will say, well, what does that look like? Oh, I'm not coping. I feel overwhelmed, this, that and the other withdraw more and I do more of the things and I leave myself with less options for what I can do to help myself. Now the impact of coronavirus is massive on people's mental health and well-being. 19.2% of adults have experienced depression. That was um, from the Office of National Statistics in June 2020. Normally it's around 9.7%, so normally it's around 1 in 10, now it's about 1 in 5 who have experienced depression. And more worryingly, what they have found is that there are new cases. It's not just people who have had a history of depression and poor mental health who are struggling with depression through COVID. Actually, there are a lot more people who are having their first experience of poor mental health, which Actually, for my business, hasn't been a bad thing because I've got companies that I'm working with who have said, you know what, our CEO now gets it. They now understand that you don't have to be weak to have poor mental health. Hallelujah. That's a, an issue that I've been trying to drive home for years. But it's starting to affect people who have never had experience of poor mental health before. And for them, it can be incredibly scary and incredibly worrying to suddenly have this thing that's outside of them that we've got no control over impacting our mental health. And if we think back to the change curve, that resistance, because we've got no control, we need to accept that we have no control and just go with what is rather than trying to hang on to what we believe should be happening in the world. And the massive impact that this has had on people's businesses. We need to try to let go of what we believe should be happening so that we can deal with what is happening. And the way that coronavirus has impacted businesses, I mean, for my business, I've unfortunately had to make two people redundant because work just fell off a cliff. Nobody was doing any training, obviously, during lockdown, and that didn't pick up quickly enough to keep people. There's also, I've also had to give up my office space that I had and revert back to working from home. And there are lots of people who have had lots of changes related to this impact, corona, the impact of coronavirus as well. So with social isolation, there are lots of people who are feeling a lot more isolated and this has a real negative impact on your mental health and well-being. And neuroscience has shown that our brains actually shrink when we are socially isolated. And if you live alone, neuroscience has also shown that we sleep less well if we live alone because we have a lot more micro awakenings through the night 
as our brain is checking, am I safe? Because there's nobody else there who's got your back. So it can have a real negative impact. Those people who also are in the care environment, it's having a massive negative impact for them as they're not getting to see families apart from through a piece of glass. And we don't know how long these people will be there with us or for us. Um, so it can have a real negative impact on our well-being and our mental health. There's also financial losses. I don't know if you know how much coronavirus has cost your business, but I know it's cost mine a lot. And for some businesses, it has actually, especially the online businesses, they've had a lot of growth, but a lot of businesses have been negatively impacted, especially in the hospitality, especially in the gyms and things like that. But also in the industry that I'm in, in training, as I said, it fell off a cliff in March 2020. And it definitely hasn't got back to where it was before coronavirus came along. So it's really important to recognise that that can have a real negative impact on your well-being as well. Those financial losses, the insecurity that that can bring. Luckily, I live with my husband. We are financially secure. So while it's impacted the business, it's not impacting me so much. But for some people, it's bringing around uncertainties around housing and those uncertainties that people are facing around housing, around your business. Are you still going to have a business this time next year? There's lots of uncertainties that are around. Are you going to be able to visit your family? Are you going to be able to actually hug your parents who are in a care environment in the future? Who knows? All of those uncertainties can have a real massive impact on our well-being and our mental health. Then our housing situations as well. For people, and I touched on it earlier, for people who live alone, it can have a real negative impact on mental health. I know early days of coronavirus, I was working with people who were really struggling with their mental health. And it turned out a lot of them lived alone. They had very small apartment or living in a bed sit, trying to work in a bed sit and not having fresh outdoor space to be able to go out to and just be able to sit in their own garden. So they're always having to go out and go walking somewhere and find somewhere else to go. Um, so that can have an impact. Also, if there are lots of people in the house, if you're used to working from home, great. But are you really used to working from home with having young children running around or partners there or teenagers and everybody trying to grapple for internet space? All of these things are having a massive impact on people's mental health and well-being. And then it's having an impact on relationships. So there have been a lot of breakups during coronavirus. There have been a lot of relationships that have struggled. I know that domestic violence has gone up during coronavirus. Um, it's had a real negative impact on those family issues that are coming up. Also, that disconnect with elderly relatives not being able to visit people has also created a disconnect and, and issues within families. I know for my husband's birthday, we organised some Zoom catch-ups with family. Half of it was spent trying to teach the older people how to use the technology, which was really funny. But it's you have to be able to take a light-hearted approach to those kind of things. But recognise the impact that this has had on you and your family. And then our connections. Um, we have a loss of our support networks as well during coronavirus. So it's not as easy to turn around and to ask somebody for help because we can't see them. And we make ourselves vulnerable when we reach out and ask for help. And that can be hard enough to do face to face, but to do it electronically or just over the phone can be really difficult. But I would encourage you all to take action where you can. And the first thing you can do is to recognise your stress signature. How do you respond when you're stressed? 
If you don't know how you respond when you're stressed, you're not really going to know when you're stressed. And too often, we can get to the end of the day and our shoulders come down from our ears and then we're like, oh, okay, yeah, I've been quite stressed. Or we start to feel that tension somewhere else in our bodies. Become aware of when you are not coping and then tell yourself that you will do something about it. And the things that you can do, now I really love this technique. It's a really quick, simple breathing technique. But this technique actually helps to release the stress hormones and to get them out of our body. So this technique is one called 7-Eleven breathing. And you basically, you breathe in for a count of seven, hold it for a count of four, and breathe out for a count of 11. And when you do that, it re releases those negative hormones that have built up in your body as you're feeling so stressed. So you can just practice breathing in for seven, hold, and then out for 11. What I'd encourage you to do if 7 and 11 feels like, wow, that's a lot, do 5 and 9. As long as you're breathing out for longer than you're breathing in for, 5 and 9 should do it. But just take some time to practice that breathing technique so that when you need it, it's there for you. If you find yourself feeling stressed, sit back, maybe wriggle about a bit, get that energy moving and then breathe. Sometimes we actually forget to breathe, which is quite odd, but we do. Then reset your expectations. I think, you know, how many pictures have you seen of people throwing their diaries away and things like that? And, you know, really funny things. I bet in 2015, when you were making your five-year plan, you didn't think you'd be here. Well, no, none of us did. So we need to reset our expectations. If you're running a business that has been impacted by coronavirus in a negative way or a good way, we need to reset our expectations of ourselves. If your sales have gone up and you've become busier, are you expecting yourself to deliver everything at the same standard as you were before, whilst also cramming the internet with the rest of the family? or doing childcare after school clubs aren't active and, and doing extra childcare and things like that. So we need to reset our expectations of ourselves. If it's had a negative impact on your business, allow yourself to feel it and to experience it and allow yourself to just think, right, what do I need to do? What do I need to do for me? How can I make this my reset? my reset of my business. And I've had to change my business model a lot and go from being classroom based to online based, which meant getting training, which meant I wasn't delivering any training as I was getting trained myself and then practicing and working with friends, and getting them to check and to tell me what needed to change. But the more you can do that, the more you can reset your expectations of yourself, the more you can reach out for support from others as well will also help. Identify what's achievable for you right now. If your business has had to shrink in terms of people, don't take everything on, which I'm getting ahead of myself now. Reach out, ask for help. Don't take everything on. It's not all on your shoulders. You know, when, when I went and had to shrink my business, that basically meant that I lost the person who was doing my bookkeeping for me I haven't got time or the inclination for that. I get number dyslexic. It's not a good idea. So I've asked my accountant to do my bookkeeping for me. Yes, it's slightly more expensive, but trust me, it's so much easier because that is not my skill set. If I was going to do my bookkeeping, it would take me a day a week. That's a day when I can't be reaching out, looking for new clients. I can't be actually delivering new sales. So my business will be impacted twofold. It's far better for me to pay somebody who knows what they're doing to actually do that. So I'm far happier doing that. Also, reach out for support from other people around you. Let people know that you're not coping. 
I know it's really difficult to be vulnerable, but there is a lot of research about the power of vulnerability. Allow yourself to be vulnerable. Allow yourself to reach out and say, do you know what? Just not coping at the moment. I've got friends who I can reach out to, my husband who I can reach out to. And if something's impacting me quite badly, and I know it's impacting me badly, I've also got friends who are therapists who I will reach out to and we support each other. So make sure that you are reaching out to your support network. And also that comes on to the piece about the invoicing and the accounting. Get others who are good at stuff that you're not good at and work together. You're all freelancers. You must know other freelancers. There are lots of people who have been talking at this event, but there will be lots of people you can connect with on LinkedIn. Find people who are good at the things that you're not good at. And, you know, if you can't afford it, then talk to them about, can we do a skill swap? I have done skill swaps with people in the past. Um, especially on the therapy side of things. So if somebody comes to me for therapy and I haven't got enough money, well, tell me what you're good at and we'll see if we can skill swap and work together and support each other. It's really important to recognise what you're good at, what brings the money in and what do you need to offload and allow others to do so that you can bring the money in and focus on what you need to be focused on now. To, to get your business back to where it needs to be. Then you can meditate as well. And for some people, they think of it as mindfulness, others call it meditation. Basically, it accesses the same beta brain waves that help us to actually just calm, relax, and slow down. In my therapy world, I'm a cognitive hypnotherapist. Um, so for me, I do lots of self-hypnosis, which accesses exactly the same brain waves that helps to keep us calm, helps to reduce blood pressure, and just helps us to take some of that pressure off of ourselves that we've set ourselves. So if you do find yourself getting tense, just five minutes of mindfulness or meditation or self-hypnosis, whatever you want to call that, helps you to just reset. And get to a point where you can feel, yeah, I can cope with this. And recognise you don't have to be on your own with everything. And then my final tip, exercise. You know, the government all the way along have allowed us to go outside and go for walks or runs. You don't have to just walk. But allow yourself to exercise, to move. If you don't like the word exercise, don't call it exercise. Call it movement. Find a movement that works for you. I know that gyms have closed, but why not um, meet up with a friend, suggest that you do an online exercise class, something that you both enjoy, and then you can do it together over Zoom and just enjoy that workout together, but with somebody else as well. Or go for walks. I'm getting so many socially distanced walks. It's brilliant. But do something that makes you feel good, that helps you to move, that helps you to, again, release some of those stress hormones. If we are breathing differently where we are releasing those stress hormones, then that's really good for us. So it's now down to you to take something from this talk. So what can you do? Take that time, spot your behaviour, spot when you're stressed. Reset your expectations of yourself and the world, quite honestly. I think if coronavirus has taught us anything, it's that control is an utter illusion. The only thing you can control is your response to what's going on. So reset your expectations. Don't hold on to your beliefs of how things should be as you're growing your business or rebuilding your business or just starting out in business. Don't try to do everything yourself, and that's just at home and at work. You know, reach out, ask for help. If you find you're the one who's got the, the brunt of the family organisation as well, ask the rest of the family to get involved. Share the load at home and at work. Remember to move in a way that excites you, something that you really enjoy. Do the 7-Eleven breathing and mindfulness, meditation, whatever you want to call it. 
give yourself permission to take time for you. Look after yourself.